Glenn Beck. The Blaze Radio Network. So how good do we have it here in America? Let me just, I'll just have you answer this question. Have you ever been so destitute that you actually thought, I wonder how much they'd give me for my kidney? I can guarantee you that it has been thought of in many places around the world, but not here in America. I mean, I mean, going to a loan shark with selling one of your organs on the black market for quick cash. How much are your organs worth? How much could you sell your eyes for if you were forced to sell them? How much could your family get for your heart? These organs are actually worth a lot more than you thought. A kidney can fetch $200,000 on the black market. By the way, 75% of all black market sales, kidneys. All-time bestseller, this kidney's got to go. Corneas, $24,400. The heart is only worth 119000 Bone marrow, you can sell your bone marrow, $23,000 per gram. I mean... I don't know how much marrow is in there, but I might have it. 23,000 a gram, I might have some marrow I could spare from time to time. The reason why I bring this up is because, A, I mean, it's insane that there is a price list for organs. But there's also a problem with organ sales, and especially it's happening in the Middle East. We were going to announce something um, with Operation OUR this week, but because they are having some really dicey elections going on right now, and we have to see how the dust settles, they have a referendum going on. We have to see how the dust settles. We're we're putting that on pause for a little while, but we are ready to do something truly remarkable. Truly remarkable. Um. But because of what I've been working on, I happen to know about the organ sales that are going on. Did you see the report yesterday, Stu, on the number of slaves that are out now? <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, what is it, 40? 40.3 million. 40.3 million slaves, and that's more than the entire history uh, of the old school slave trade that we think was so. So I, this weekend, I was up at the Nantucket Project, and I said, I was talking about slavery. And I said there are more slavery, more slaves than the entire Western slave trade, the 400 years of Western slave trade, Mm. alive today, combined. All of them combined. 400 years, there's more more people alive today in chains than that. That That's an incredible stat. And to uh, to back you on that, when you first said it, I was like, oh, geez, where did I get that? (laughs) <laughs> I mean, I didn't believe you. And I well, so I went and looked it up, and it is actually legitimately a true statistic. So I, and you're a, a stat boy, so I know mm-hmm. you would have looked it up. <laughs> um, but that's what my, my daughter said, which because she was sitting in the crowd, and she said, nobody believed you on that stat, Dad. <laughs> I didn't believe it either. Yeah. She said, um, you know, people are like, yeah, that can't be true. And it is true. And and think of that. We're What are we doing right now? We are talking about pulling down... Uh, statues because they were for slavery and some of them were saying that they that uh, the founders were bad because they were silent on slavery even though most of them weren't they were silent on slavery and the argument is wait a minute you can't judge them 250 years ago the slavery was a normal thing back then so they had to be wildly forward thinking to be against it Okay, how about today? We're all clearly against it, right? We all know slavery is wrong. Do you know how ISIS is now funding itself? Because we, we, we bombed the, the direct route of the oil trade. Do you know one of the main ways they are funding ISIS right now? The slave trade, and even worse, kidneys. They are kidnapping children. And they are cutting the kidneys and the hearts out of them, and they are selling them on the black market. 
Where are the abolitionists today? Seriously, where are the abolitionists today? This is the hardest. This is the hardest thing. I watched a um, a documentary last night, and I'm not recommending that you watch it um, because uh, it's called "I Am Jane Doe," and it's really it's it's powerful. It is powerful, but it's all about the slave trade, and it's all about it's all about America today, and how kids in America are being kidnapped, and they are being used in in the sex industry against their will. They are being drugged and beaten, and they're actually, believe it or not, the village voice was the main perpetrator of the sales for this, okay, called their back page. Oh, yeah, they were placing ads for Yes, yeah. and that's still, it's still not taken care of. It's still not shut down, and it is, it's remarkable what is going on. And I thought to myself, I'm, I'm watching this. I'm thinking nobody's watching this movie. Nobody is watching this movie because it's too horrific. And that is the problem that our founders had back 200 and some years ago when they were when they were upset about it and they wanted to stop it. Benjamin Franklin was one of the biggest abolitionists, if not the biggest abolitionist uh, of the founding era uh, era. And he. Um, he couldn't get people to listen because what happened? It's not affecting me. It can't be that bad of a problem because most people didn't have slaves. It can't be that much of a problem. Well, they did something to deserve it. That's what we think. But what did they think? Well, they're not really people like us. Anything that'll keep you blind. And so how do you get that story out? And we are facing exactly the same issue on trying to get that story out as our founders did at the, the founding of our country. And the same issue that Abraham Lincoln did. We have at Mercury One a, a, a letter written by Abraham Lincoln as he is trying to figure out how do I explain to people that slavery is wrong? Now think of that. How do I explain to people that slavery is wrong? We now know, we know it's wrong. And yet, we can't bring ourselves to look at it because it is so horrifically ugly. But I want you to know, if we really want to change things, not for us, but for our children and grandchildren, we cannot miss this opportunity to be an abolitionist now because they're going to look back and say, well, your parents and your grandparents and your great, great grandparents, they were putting up with this. Where were they then? Well, they were trying. Don't be considered an abolitionist in today's world. Be considered an abolitionist. Take a strong stand on something that we know is clearly wrong. And what you do when you stand up against it is clearly right picture three empty boats floating in a harbor pointed out to sea with 60 kids lined up on the shore waiting to board. One by one, the kids step down into the boats. One little girl wears a Hello Kitty pajama top. And the rest of the kids, they seem to be dressed for a party. Thousands of people passing by see the kids this morning as they make their way through the town. But nobody really thought to ask what's happening with all these kids and what party are they going to? nobody saw the signs. Usually the simple act of herding kids through town and unloading them onto a tour boat isn't that impressive. But if you have the eyes to see, today's journey by boat is a step back in time loaded with meaning. These children, just like slaves of the past, have been forced to wear a happy face by their captors. Five traffickers and a cocaine dealer who stood about 20 yards away laughing at the group of rich Americans. 
The scene lacks whips and shackles of the historic African coast, but make no mistake, this is a slave boat. The kids here are bought and sold just like they were in the past, a simple commodity. Once the kids strapped on their little life vest and sat down in the boats, their captains were instructed by the traffickers to launch. The traffickers and their American buyers follow by speedboat. And as it goes, the traffickers, perhaps in a hurry to get their cash, fail to notice the signs of mutiny all around them. What were those signs? Four armed Colombian officials dressed as boat captains. Five Americans snapping cell phone pictures and taking videos like drunk tourists. A camera bearing drone circling just a few hundred yards overhead. And just out of view, three Colombian Navy boats awaiting the signal. This is Operation Underground Railroad. But the more poignant signs of mutiny were coming from the kids themselves. As one slave boat launched, an older girl on board huddled the kids together and prayed, God bring us home safe. On the second boat, a different girl wore a cut off t-shirt with an image of Jesus printed on the front. A Hail Mary to any man, woman or angel with a conscience and courage. And today, Praise God, men and angels were listening. Within 30 minutes of disembarking onto the private island where the kids were preparing to meet their temporary masters, while they waited in one section of the house, on the other side, a deal was being made. Cash was being exchanged and a signal was being given. Colombian Navy captains in raid gear drove their boats right onto the sand and stormed the beach. Forty kids emancipated. The rehabilitation and recovery experts were also there trying to help the kids start that long journey to true freedom. But watching their captors march away in handcuffs at gunpoint was a pretty good start. As the American undercover operators walked back towards the boats, they heard what sounded like laughter at first. Then they realized the laughter had turned to cheers, as if to say, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. Since first announcing Operation Underground Railroad on the blaze, you have funded fast, effective missions over 614 trafficking survivors have been rescued and 260 monsters are behind bars. Slavery must stop now. If you haven't yet, become an abolitionist and join us at OurRescue.org. You know, for me, the interest in contemporary forms of slavery started with a leaflet that I picked up in London. It was the early 90s, and I was at a public event, and I saw this leaflet, and it said, there are millions of slaves in the world today, and I thought, no way, no way. And I'm going to admit to hubris, because I also, I'm going to admit to you, I also thought, how can I be like a hotshot young full professor who teaches human rights and not know this so it can't be true? Well, if you teach, if you worship in the temple of learning, do not mock the gods because they will take you, fill you with curiosity and desire and drive you, drive you with a passion to change things. I went out and did a lit review, 3,000 articles on the keyword slavery Two turned out to be about contemporary, only two. All the rest were historical. There were press pieces and they were full of outrage, they were full of speculation, they were anecdotal, no solid information. So I began to do a research project of my own. I went to five countries around the world. I looked 
at slaves, I met slaveholders, and I looked very deeply into slave-based businesses because this is an economic crime. People do not enslave people to be mean to them. They do it to make a profit. And I got to tell you, what I found out in the world in, in four different continents was depressingly familiar, like this. Agricultural workers in Africa whipped and beaten, showing us how they were beaten in the fields before they escaped from slavery and met up with our film crew. It was, it was mind blowing. And I want to be very clear. I'm talking about real slavery. This is not about lousy marriages. This is not about jobs that suck. This is about people who cannot walk away, people who are forced to work without pay, people who are operating 24-7 under a threat of violence and have no pay. It's real slavery in exactly the same way that slavery would be recognized throughout all of human history. Now, where is it? Well, this map in the sort of redder, yellower colors are the places with the highest densities of slavery. But in fact, that kind of bluey color are the countries where we can't find any cases of slavery. And you might notice that it's only Iceland and Greenland where we can't find any cases of enslavement around the world. We're also particularly interested and in looking very carefully at places where slaves are being used to perpetrate extreme environmental destruction. Around the world, slaves are used to destroy the environment, cutting down trees in the Amazon, destroying forest areas in West Africa, mining and spreading mercury around in places like Ghana and the Congo, destroying the coastal ecosystems in South Asia. It's a pretty harrowing linkage between what's happening to our environment and what's happening to our human rights. Now, how on earth did we get to a situation like this? where we have 27 million people in slavery in the year 2010. That's double the number that came out of Africa in the entire transatlantic slave trade. Well, it builds up with these factors. They're not causal, they're actually supporting factors. One is we all know about, the population explosion, the world goes from two billion people to almost seven billion people in the last 50 years. Being numerous does not make you a slave add in the increased vulnerability of very large numbers of people in the developing world caused by civil wars, ethnic conflicts, kleptocratic governments, disease, you, you name it, you know it, we understand how that works. In some countries, all of those things happen at once, like Sierra Leone a few years ago, and push enormous parts, about a billion people in the world, in fact, as we know, live on the edge, live in situations where they don't have any opportunity and are usually even destitute. But that doesn't make you a slave either. What it takes to turn a person who's destitute and vulnerable into a slave is the absence of the rule of law. If the rule of law is sound, it protects the poor and it protects the vulnerable. But if corruption creeps in and people don't have the opportunity to have that protection of the rule of law, then if you can use violence, if you can use violence with impunity, you can reach out and harvest the vulnerable into slavery. Well, that's precisely what has happened around the world. Though, for a lot of people, the way they come into slavery today, the people who step into slavery today, don't usually get kidnapped or knocked over the head. They come into slavery because someone's asked them this question. All around the world, I've been told an almost identical story. People say, I was home, someone came into our village, they stood up in the back of a truck, they said, I've got jobs, who needs a job? And they did exactly what you or I would do in the same situation. They said, that guy looks sketchy. I was suspicious, but my children were hungry. We needed medicine. I knew I had to do anything I could to earn some money to support the people I care about. They climb into the back of the truck, they go off with the person who recruits them. 10 miles, 100 miles, 1,000 miles later, they find themselves in dirty, dangerous, demeaning work. They take it for a little while, but when they try to leave, bang, the hammer comes down and they discover they're enslaved. Now, that kind of slavery is again, pretty much what slavery has been through all human history. 
But there is one thing that's particularly remarkable and novel about slavery today, and that is a complete collapse in the price of human beings. Expensive in the past, dirt cheap now, even the business programs have started picking up on this. I just want to share a little clip for you. Okay, lively discussion guaranteed here as always as we get macro and talk commodities. Continuing here in the studio with our guest Michael O'Donoghue, Head of Commodities at Four Continents Capital Management. And we're also joined by Brent Lawson from Lawson Frisk Securities. Happy to be here. Good to have you with us, Brent. Now, gentlemen, Brent, where's your money going this year? Well, Daphne, we've been going short on gas and oil recently and casting our net just a little bit wider. We really like the human being story a lot. Uh, if you look at a long-term chart, prices are at historical lows, and yet global demand for forced labor is still real strong. So that's a scenario that we think we should be capitalizing on. Michael, what's your take on the people story? Are you interested? Well, oh, definitely. Non-voluntary labor's greatest advantage as an asset is the endless supply. We're not about to run out of people. No other commodity has that. Daphne, if I may draw your attention to one thing, that is that private equity has been sniffing around, and that tells me that this market is about to explode. Uh, Africans and Indians, as usual, uh, South Americans, and Eastern Europeans in particular are on our buy list. Interesting. Michael, bottom line, what's your recommend? We're recommending to our clients a buy and hold strategy. There's no need to play the market. There's a lot of vulnerable people out there. It's very exciting. Exciting stuff indeed. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Okay, you figured it out. That's a spoof. Though I enjoyed watching your jaws drop, drop, drop until you got it. Uh, MTV Europe uh, worked with us and made that spoof, and they've been slipping it in between music videos without any introduction, which I think is kind of fun. Here's the reality. The price of human beings across the last 40,000 years in today's money has averaged about $40,000. Capital purchase items. You can see that the lines cross when the population explodes. The average price of a human being today around the world is about $90. They're more expensive in places like North America. You could, slaves cost between three to $8,000 in North America. But I could take you places in India or Nepal where human beings can be acquired for five or $10. The key here is that people have ceased to be that capital purchase item and become like styrofoam cups. You buy them cheaply, you use them, you crumple them up, and then when you're done with them, you just throw them away. These young boys are in Nepal. They are basically the transport system on a quarry run by a slaveholder. There are no roads there, so they carry loads of stone on their backs, often of their own weight, up and down the Himalaya mountains. One of their mothers said to us, you know, we can't survive here, but we can't even seem to die either. It's a horrible situation, and if there's anything that makes me feel very positive about this, it's that there are also, in addition to young men like this who are still enslaved, there are ex-slaves who are now working to free others. Or we say, Frederick Douglass is in the house. I don't know if you've ever had a daydream about, wow, what would it be like to meet Harriet Tubman? What would it be like to meet Frederick Douglass? I, I've got to say, one of the most exciting parts about my job is that I get to. And I want to introduce you to one of those. His name is James Kofi Annan. He was a slave child in Ghana enslaved in the fishing industry. And he now, after escape and building a new life, has formed an organization that we work closely with to go back and get people out of slavery. This is not James, this is one of the kids that he works with. He was hit with a paddle, you know, in the hair. And this reminds me of my childhood when I used to work here. James and our country director in Ghana, Emmanuel Oto, are now receiving regular death threats because the two of them managed to get convictions and imprisonment for three human traffickers for the very first time in Ghana for enslaving people from the fishing industry, enslaving children. Now, everything I've been telling you, I admit, is pretty disheartening. But there's actually a very positive side to this. And that is this. The 27 million people who are in slavery today, that's a lot of people. But it's also the smallest fraction of the global population to ever be in slavery. And likewise, the $40 billion that they generate into the global economy each year is the tiniest proportion of the global economy to ever be represented by slave labor. 
slavery, with illegal in every country, has been pushed to the edges of our global society. And in a way, without us even noticing, has ended up standing on the precipice of its own extinction, waiting for us to give it a big boot and knock it over and get rid of it. And it can be done. Now, if we do that, if we put the resources and the focus to it, what does it actually cost to get people out of slavery? Well, first, before I even tell you the cost, I gotta be absolutely clear. We do not buy people out of slavery. Buying people out of slavery is like paying a burglar to get your television back. It's abetting a crime. Liberation, however, costs some money. Liberation, and more importantly, all the work that comes after liberation. It's not an event, it's a process. It's about helping people to build lives of dignity, stability, economic autonomy, citizenship. Well, amazingly, in places like India, where costs are very low, that family, that three generation family that you see there, who were in hereditary slavery, so the granddad there was born a baby into slavery, but the total cost amortized across the rest of the work was about $150 to bring that family out of slavery and then take them through a two-year process to build a stable life of citizenship and education. A boy in Ghana rescued from fishing and slavery, about $400. In the United States, North America, much more expensive, legal costs, medical costs, we understand that. It's, it's expensive here, about $30,000. But most of the people in the world in slavery live in those places where the costs are lowest. And in fact, the global average is about what it is for Ghana. And that means when you multiply it up, the estimated cost of not just freedom, but sustainable freedom for the entire 27 million people on the planet in slavery is something like $10.8 billion. What Americans spend on potato chips and pretzels. What Seattle's gonna spend on its light rail system. Usually the annual expenditure in this country on blue jeans. Or in the last holiday period, when we bought Game Boys and iPods and other tech gifts for people, we spent $10.8 billion. Intel's fourth quarter earnings, $10.8 billion. It's not a lot of money at the global level. In fact, it's, it's peanuts. And the great thing about it is that it's not money down a hole, there's a freedom dividend. When you let people out of slavery to work for themselves, they, are they motivated? They take their kids out of the workplace, they build a school, they say, we're gonna have stuff we've never had before, like three squares, medicine when we're sick, clothing when we're cold. They become consumers and producers and local economies begin to spiral up very rapidly. That's important, all of that, about how we rebuild sustainable freedom, because we never want to repeat what happened in this country in 1865. Four million people were lifted up out of slavery and then dumped. Dumped without political participation, decent education, any kind of real opportunity in terms of economic lives, and then sentenced to generations of violence and prejudice and discrimination, and America is still paying the price for the botched emancipation of 1865. We have made a commitment that we will never let people come out of slavery on our watch and end up as second-class citizens. It's just not gonna happen. This is what liberation really looks like. Children rescued from slavery in the fishing industry in Ghana, reunited with their parents, and then taken with the parents back to their villages to rebuild their economic well-being so that they become slave-proof. Absolutely unenslavable. Now, this woman lived in a village in Nepal. We'd been working there about a month. They had just begun to come out of a hereditary kind of slavery. They had just begun to light up a little bit, open up a little bit. But when we went to speak with her, when we took this photograph, the slaveholders were still menacing us from the sidelines. They hadn't been really pushed back. I was frightened, we were frightened. And we said to her, are you worried? Are you upset? She said, no, because we've got hope now. How could we not succeed, she said. 
when people like you from the other side of the world are coming here to stand beside us? Okay, we have to ask ourselves, are we willing to live in a world of slavery? If we don't take action, we just leave ourselves open to have someone else jerk the strings that tie us to slavery in the products we buy and in our government policies. And yet, if there's one thing that every human being can agree on, I think it's that slavery should end. And if there's a fundamental violation of our human dignity that we would all say is horrific, it's slavery. And we've got to say, well, what good is all of our intellectual and political and economic power, and I'm really thinking intellectual power in this room, if we can't use it to bring slavery to an end? I think there's enough intellectual power in, in this room to bring slavery to an end. And you know what? If we can't do that, if we can't use our intellectual power to end slavery, there's one last question. Are we truly free? Okay, thank you so much. Human trafficking is one of the fastest growing criminal industries, representing over $30 billion in illegal trade per year. At any given time, the United Nations estimates more than 2.4 million people hailing from 136 different countries are being trafficked around the world. Many end up in the sex trade. Some end up in forced labor, essentially modern slavery. The idea that so long after the Emancipation Proclamation, we should still be tolerating this, strikes me as a completely unacceptable. Although it is undeniably a global phenomenon, the U.S., as one of the world's human trafficking importers, bears a special responsibility to combat this practice. Our obligation now is to find it where it exists and finally extinguish it. The U.S. and the international community have adopted various treaties and laws to prevent trafficking. But will it be enough? Modern Day Slavery, next on Great Decisions. They're often hidden in plain sight. Human beings have been trafficked for use as forced labor, prostitutes, or even for the removal of their organs. When we say uh, human trafficking, we're talking about a problem of forced labor that's plaguing tens of millions of people. And it's a more serious problem in terms of absolute numbers than in any other time in human history. You would be amazed how often you have seen it. But that's the reality, is that until you start looking for it, it just looks like somebody who's at work in a factory or in a mine or on a farm. Or, or, or how would you know if you don't know what to look for? It's just somebody at work. The United States considers the term human trafficking to be an umbrella term that stands for all of the activities involved in reducing someone to or holding them in a condition of compelled service. It happens to men and women adults and children. They are abducted, coerced, or deceived by traffickers into a life of exploitation that's difficult to escape. A so-called labor recruiter will come into rural villages and uh, tell men, well, we have a great job for you in one of the Gulf states. Or they'll tell a girl, uh, we have a great job for you in Kathmandu or along the Chinese border in a hotel or a restaurant. But I need to hold on to your passport before we get there. Of course, all this is a trap. They promise them things. We're gonna give you work. You can work as a, in a hotel, as a maid, or you can work in someone else as the domestic servant. And once they get there, often their papers, their documents are taken, and then they're coerced into working for the trafficker or his uh, associates. I was a general manager in the biggest bank in Indonesia. I lost my job because of the economic turbulence fell out. I couldn't work 
and I applied a job in the newspaper. The advertisement it was in the newspaper. I got legitimate paperwork. Well, I came to United States. They didn't put me in the job that they offer. They put me into sex business. The U.S., European Union, the United Nations, and a host of international organizations are working to combat the trade that nets the traffickers an estimated $50 billion a year. And the figures get worse. Forced labor, another term for slavery, involves an estimated 20.9 million people, some of whom were trafficked, according to the International Labor Organization. That notion of 21 million people, I mean, that's bigger than the populations of London, New York, and Mexico City combined. Their numbers showed a two-third, one-third split. Two-thirds involved in labor trafficking, forced labor, one-third involved in being coerced into the commercial sex trade. But most of the victims of human trafficking are really going to be in these common industries of making bricks, farming rice, rock quarries, very, very manual labor, which if you looked at it from the outside, you would have no idea that there was slavery taking place. The numbers may be higher. The nature of trafficking makes gathering information difficult. Part of what makes trafficking such a complicated issue is that to really measure the scale of something that happens in a subterranean fashion that is all about kind of the underworld, all about things happening behind closed doors, I think it's extraordinarily difficult to conceive of you know, how many people are trafficked. It's also the definitional issue. Uh, if a child is 12 years old and he's working making rugs, is he forced labor? Uh, and uh, you know, he's making money for the family so they can eat and supporting them is helping the family work in the back room just forced labor, uh, so a great deal of it is unreported. Profits generated from forced labor can add up to $150 billion a year. It's about the third most profitable criminal activity in the world. There are about 30 million slaves in the world. Uh, the, how much profit is generated to some degree depends on the type of slavery. The most profitable form of slavery is sex trafficking, but there's a profit in every form of it. There's not one structure to human trafficking. There are traffickers that may be a couple individuals or a husband and wife, and then you can have larger organizations such as the Mogilevsky organization out of the former Soviet Union that had human trafficking as one element of its larger criminal profile. Human trafficking is not illegal immigration, an act which is committed voluntarily. The Trafficking Victims Protection Act that came out in the year 2000 essentially defines the crime in three buckets. One is children being held in the commercial sex trade. Two is adults who are in this commercial sex trade, but they're through force, fraud, or coercion. And three is anyone forced to work in some sort of labor or services, again, through force, fraud, or coercion. Can you walk away? Are you being compelled? Are you being compensated? Are you in debt? How did you get here? So you can ask these questions and find out whether there's slavery. Broadly speaking, human beings are trafficked from poor regions to wealthier ones. But it's not uncommon for victims to remain in the area where they were once free. Trafficking doesn't have to go across borders. It can be within this country. Uh, it doesn't have to be any great movement. Usually it could be within the same town, the same province, the same state. We've been having to explain to everyone that human trafficking is a euphemism, that we should look past those words and look back at the original intent, which is that nobody should be subjected to slavery. Three quarters of those slaves or modern victims of trafficking are in three countries. They're in India, Pakistan, and China. And in fact, in one country, India, there are 15 million people held as victims of human trafficking. And so you have in one country uh, more than half the victims in the world. Though much of the trafficking trade occurs in Asia, the U.S. is not immune. I know that a lot of Americans will think, oh my goodness, this is so far away from me. It's really, you know, not in my bailiwick. But actually, if you look around you, even in New York City, in Boston, in Washington, D.C., you will find traffic girls. And they may be people who are very close to you, much closer than you even think. 
We have an estimate that there's 100,000 children in prostitution in the United States, which is a giant number of children being commercially sexually exploited. It is a national problem. Right now, there are, there are almost 300,000 children. I'm not talking about adult women. 300,000 children that are being trafficked right here within our borders. Japan is a gigantic market. Korea is a gigantic market. Parts of Southeast Asia, Thailand, Cambodia are also huge markets. And I think I wouldn't underestimate places like the United States. The UN suggests more than a quarter of trafficking victims are children, girls and boys, unable to defend themselves against lives as factory workers, prostitutes, child soldiers, or domestic servants. A very large proportion of the victims of human trafficking are children. The perpetrators are going to actually focus intentionally on those who are most vulnerable. Who can I most easily coerce into my rock quarry, into my brick factory? Who can I control with violence most easily without them fighting back? Every three children trafficked, two are girls, and most of them are involved in sexual exploitation. It varies by region. Some places like uh, in the Middle East, a, a lot of forced labor. Africa, similarly, children involved in forced labor or sexual exploitation, and in Europe, it, uh, largely sexual exploitation. It's more of teenagers, but they're sometimes younger than teenagers. But they work in brickwork. In Africa, they work in getting fish, in cocoa plantations, and others. And sometimes children in Africa have been trafficked into being child soldiers for conflicts. Very young teenage girls have been trafficked partly because their families are desperate. They don't have any way of sustaining themselves. And girls are, in any case, often considered kind of marginal members of the family, or the most disposable members of the family. The International Labor Organization, the ILO, estimates that perpetrators can earn $4,000 a year from a person in forced labor. Trafficking for sexual exploitation accounts for a larger share. 58% of the trade, and is focused in Europe, North America, and Central Asia. There was a ring of high-end trafficked women from the Soviet Union operating in Los Angeles. In that case, the business generated about $7 million a year. And in the business of Hispanic brothels, in which women are trafficked from Latin America to serve migrant labor, the profits for a trafficker may be a million dollars a year. So it very much depends on the market that's being served. On the criminal side, two-thirds of those working in human trafficking rings are men. But it's a popular crime for women, too. 30% of human trafficking convictions are women, more than double the average rate of women's convictions for any other crime. Women have an additional advantage, and that is that they seem to have a strong capacity to win the trust of those who are vulnerable that a woman can win the trust of a young woman uh, to lure her away from her village to come to a city, and then she's trafficked in the commercial sex trade. Some of them even may have been trafficked victims earlier in their careers, but made uh, the horrible choice of becoming the girlfriend of one of the traffickers to survive. Uh, at some point, though, she becomes the criminal herself. So it's a bit like the Stockholm Syndrome, where you begin to identify with the person who's captured you, you begin to see this as your aspiration to be a good trafficker. Regardless of where trafficking occurs, violence and intimidation are a common theme. The most marginalized people are the victims of human trafficking, and they are trying to better themselves in their lives. And that desire is then grabbed onto by a trafficker to move them out of their family and their community, sometimes out of their country, to a place where they can be exploited with violence. It was horrible because they didn't fit you. They put you into the darkness. No food, alcohol, and drug on the table. They scared me with a gun, with a knife, with a baseball bat, and also they have a police badge to scare me. So at that moment, I didn't know how my life looked like, but I tried to survive. The problem of human trafficking has taken hold in the international community's collective conscience, and steps are being taken to combat it. 
There are a lot of challenges we face all over the world, from education to climate change, a lot of issues that I care about. This issue of modern slavery is one, though, that I think goes to the heart of our moral obligation. Historically, there was, in fact, by the global community, a, a great decision to end slavery as a matter of law. And what we have to decide now is whether to turn that decision about law and policy into a permanent reality. The UN and its partner, the ILO, have developed legal frameworks agreed to by most of the international community to combat the trade. The United Nations, beginning of the 2000s, adopted a convention on transnational crime. And along with this convention were protocols on human smuggling and trafficking. And most of the countries in the world are now signatories. And this is simply to have standards that invoke criminal penalties for those who engage in trafficking, uh, to ensure that there's inspection of workplaces, and to ensure that workers know what their rights are. We, as the Bureau of International Labor Affairs, are the lead U.S. government representative at the International Labor Organization. And just this past June, at the International Labor Conference, we worked very hard to negotiate a new binding protocol. It will help advance efforts to combat forced labor, human trafficking, and some of the worst forms of child labor by explicitly calling for countries to adopt and implement tools that will help prevent, protect, and compensate the victims of this basic human rights violation. Because of these treaties, governments agree to provide legal protections for victims. However, challenges still remain. Policing forced labor is difficult, and prosecution for traffickers is low. In many parts of the world, the law enforcement that's supposed to be enforcing the law are complicit in the human trafficking because of endemic corruption. The only reason that human trafficking can flourish in the world today like it does is because of impunity. That is to say, a lack of simple law enforcement. People who are the victims often are reluctant to come forward because they could misbelieve that they're going to be put in jail, incarcerated, or deported. Often they come across borders without the necessary papers, and they're unaware of their human rights. Even when I go to police officer, they didn't believe me. I went to Consul General to ask help. They didn't help me. I seek help in the community. They didn't believe me until one day I met someone that connected me to FBI and I got help and my life getting better now. Non-governmental organizations around the world have taken up the charge as well raising awareness, offering rehabilitation, or in some cases, operating anonymous tip lines for people to call in suspected forced labor or human trafficking situations. There's the beginning of a coalition of civil society organizations stretching across many countries that is coming together to fight slavery. There's mounting evidence about what's effective, because if we're gonna end slavery, we actually have to know how to end it the global movement can do way better when it comes to hotlines, when it comes to prevention messaging, when it comes to ed educating people about their rights before they get into a, a job, before they migrate for a job. Much of our attention has been on rescuing victims, but unfortunately in the world today, there's an endless supply of victims. And we're not doing enough to go after the business of human trafficking, to go after this the way we go after the drug trade to try and reduce the profitability and increase the risk for the traffickers. Refugees, people who have fled war or conflict, are particularly vulnerable. The UN is working to raise awareness so that at-risk populations do not fall prey to the crime cartels. Over and over, all around the world, we've seen that refugee populations are particularly vulnerable to trafficking. If one looks at uh, the recent evolution, um, in 2011, all over the world, we had 14,000 people displaced by conflict per day, internally and externally. In 2012, 23,000. 
in 2013, 32,000. Conflict regions are major sources of trafficking victims because individuals lose their social support. They've had the people who are the traditional protectors in their families, the husbands, the fathers, the brothers killed, and therefore the women are, are especially vulnerable. So one of the things that's so important whenever we're setting up a refugee camp, whether it's through the UN or International Organization for Migration, is to ensure that there is policing so that when the traffickers start sniffing around, they realize that they're not going to be able to recruit out of the camp. Sometimes it's actually the risk of trafficking that leads people to become refugees. And that's what we saw in this recent exodus of uh, children from some of the Central American countries. What these children were doing was running away from becoming enslaved into criminal gangs. As a global leader, the U.S. is using its influence to help curb human trafficking around the world. The U.S. State Department issues its annual trafficking persons report. In that report, uh, group countries, according to tiers, which countries have successfully implementing sort of the principles and, and recommendations of the protocol on human trafficking that was adopted by the United Nations. And uh, they're providing funds as well as reports and assisting countries in developing skills and knowledge bases and, and staff and abilities and institutions to deal with trafficking. We assess the activities of governments along three parameters, prevention, protection, and prosecution. And every year we also rank those governments as to what they're working on. And we put forth recommendations to these countries as to how they can improve with respect to law enforcement, with respect to the substantive laws on the books, with respect to their own policies, with respect to data collection, in their efforts to combat the worst forms of child labor. Every country is in fact graded on a scale of one to three, uh, and the, the lower numbers are good numbers. The higher the number, the worse the behavior of the country. Through the State Department's report, there is a clearer definition of human trafficking and the consequences of allowing it to take place. I have seen governments in the developing world completely transform their willingness to fight trafficking on the basis of their relationship with the United States and on the basis of the international community's insistence that they do something about it. A country that is on tier three in the United States Annual Trafficking Persons Report could be subjected to sanctions, everything from restrictions on U.S. foreign assistance and military aid to the United States having to vote against them in international financial institutions like the World Bank and others. It's sometimes used in a very political fashion and hasn't been very effective in getting states to be more responsive. It has worked in some cases that are dependent on U.S. aid, but for many countries that are poor and under-resourced, trafficking is not one of their priorities. The U.S. must also take actions within its own borders to stop traffickers and support the victims. We operate the National Human Trafficking Resource Center for the United States, which is the 24-hour national hotline on human trafficking for America. We were able to propose and then the legislature passed our legislation that greatly strengthens how we treat traffickers and how we help the victims of it and making it a very, very serious crime in Arizona. One of the things that's interesting about the American anti-trafficking law is that we are required to give restitution to the victims. And so the court has to do an analysis in every one of these cases as to what's the value of their services, whether or not it was legal for them to be doing that thing or not. The business community, which can indirectly fund forced labor in other countries, can help the situation too. If you're a company that's engaged in production, you can hire expertise to help monitor your supply chain and make sure that your products are not being produced by slave labor in the country that, where your factories are located. Stopping traffickers is important, but helping victims to start a new life can't be ignored. You actually started out in a place of desperate poverty, and you will go right back to a place of vulnerability if there aren't appropriate aftercare services. There's still a ways to go in the U.S., resources for victim services, for shelters and, and victim care, not where they need to be. 
When you find a trafficking victim, the federal standard is they should be treated like a victim. The story needs to be told because in United States, still don't believe if human trafficking happen in our community, in our, our backyard. As a survivor, as an outcomer, the biggest challenge is how we empower survivors to get back on their feet. It's going to take more than reports and laws to put an end to the problem. It's going to take persistence at every level, from criminal prosecution to victim assistance, before we see an end to the trade in human beings. Great Decisions is produced by the Foreign Policy Association in association with Thomson Reuters. Funding for Great Decisions is provided by PricewaterhouseCoopers, LLP.